everyone for coming. I'd like to now introduce the mayor of the city of Boise, Mayor Dave Peter. Good afternoon and welcome. It's a great crowd. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to resist the temptation to call on somebody up here. Uh, it would be kind of fun. The, uh, this is Constitution Day, and uh, it's a real joy for us to have uh, this caliber of speaker and this great crowd uh, here in town. Uh, I'm uh, happy to say I'm going to be able to stay for uh, further remarks. Um, but your presence here, I know there's some CLE credits involved, which are always nice. But uh, such a great crowd will allow uh, Concordia and uh, maybe other folks to bring more of these kinds of speakers here. And we couldn't be any, uh, any happier about that. And to Mr. Dunnaville, who apparently took a deposition in Boise several decades ago, maybe. Or, uh, and it's changed a bit, but we're so happy that, to have you back and to welcome you here. So thank you very much, and uh, back over to Dean Kathy Siley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Beter. It's wonderful that you would take the time to join us and to offer your remarks as well. And it's always great when we can show off the city of Boise to a distinguished visitor like Mr. Dunneville, and he'll carry word of our city uh, back to his part of the country and with his nationwide, whoops, nationwide colleagues. Um, it is my honor to have gotten to know Mr. Dunneville over the last two days. We've spent some time together. Uh, he and I worked in the same office years ago, although at different times, so we, we had some fun reminiscing about that. Uh, you have his biography as part of your materials. But let me just share with you a few of the highlights that I gathered from that. And it's, it's just so appropriate that our Constitution Day celebration in this 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act and the 60th anniversary year of Brown versus Board of Education, that we would have a guest speaker with us here today who really has had experiences with both of these landmark milestone events in our, our recent constitutional history. So uh, just a little bit about Mr. Donneville's background. He is a well-known attorney, civil rights veteran, legal reformer, author, and activist for justice. He has been active in the civil rights movement since the 1950s, although as his biography points out, really even as a very young child, he resisted Jim Crow. He was growing up in Virginia, and he resisted having to sit in the back of the bus uh, so I, I love the image of you, Mr. Dunneville, as, as just a young, feisty child sticking up for the rights of yourself and others. It's, it's truly inspiring. Uh, so in the 1950s, he started participating in sit-ins during college. He was a college student at Morgan State College in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so while he was a college student, he attended the Brown v. Board of Education argument. There were five consolidated cases and he attended the first day of the arguments uh, in December of 1953. And um, just an amazing thing to watch. You were part of history. So um, he also participated in the March on Washington in 1963, uh, and of course saw the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King at that march. Uh, Mr. Dunneville traveled to Mississippi to enforce the Voting Rights Act, the voting rights of African Americans as a volunteer attorney with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and that was principally in 1967. He was a volunteer, and he took a leave of absence from his then position at AT&T as a corporate attorney. He tells a rather harrowing tale about being chased out of a Mississippi town by a sheriff at shotgun when attempting to protect the rights of a black citizen in that town. So. Uh, and in later years, he came to know Thurgood Marshall personally and his family, and he also became a close friend, colleague, and confidant of Oliver W. Hill and Spotswood Robinson, both distinguished attorneys who tried the Virginia case, Davis versus Prince Edward County, which was one of the five consolidated cases under Brown v. Board of Education. Um, Mr. Dunneville was the first lawyer of color employed by the Internal Revenue Service uh, in New York City, and he was the first attorney of color hired by AT&T. 
He was a pioneer business lawyer and civil rights activist, and his career spans more than, than five decades. So before we welcome Mr. Dunneville, I also want to thank those of you that are in our overflow room. I mean, it's really, we've really had terrific response to this event. Uh, just a little bit about how that's going to go on. There will be opportunity today for questions during Mr. Dunneville's time with us. So to ensure that all participants, including those seated in the overflow room, have an opportunity to raise, to hear the questions, please raise your hand, those of you here in this room, and wait for the microphone before asking your question. And so they cannot hear you in the other room unless you are mic'd. Um, but audio and visual are being transmitted to that room across the hall. Uh, additionally, if you are seated in the overflow room and would like to ask a question, we ask that you feel free to make your way across the hall through the open doors, standing along the wall with your hand raised and wait for the microphone. And uh, Professor Jody Nasker uh, will help in room 114 with the microphone. So um, a few thank yous though. I want to thank Tucker and Associates for being our audio visual specialist today. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate that. And uh, we are co-hosting this event today, Concordia University School of Law, with Attorneys for Civic Education. It is a relatively new but very vibrant organization. And we have a number of those attorneys here. They, um, they should be recognized and thanked for all of their uh, hard work in pulling this event together. So please give, give them a generous round of applause. They have let us know that after Mr. Dunbar's presentation, they will be available outside of the foyer. They will be providing our dessert today, which is very, very nice of them. And they will be available for you to look at their display and ask them questions that I'm sure they are seeking your interest and membership as well. So thank you. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Clarence Dunville to come and give his address. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunville. Thank you very much, Dean Salek. Uh, it really is a privilege to be here in Boise. Uh, I haven't been here for many, many years, several decades. But uh, I remember that the last time I was here was enjoyable as well. Although I was here on the deposition, uh, I did enjoy it. And I thought then, I, it's reinforced now, and Boise is truly a beautiful city. You know, the mountains, and it's really great. And the people of Boise, they are especially, especially great. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the welcome and the hospitality which I received. I'm going to be spending a while uh, talking about some things that happened during my life that I hope uh, you'll find of interest. And I would like very much to have a dialogue afterwards and have you ask questions or just engage in any discussion which you would like to have. Uh, and I'll be available afterwards. I'm not limited in the time. I'll be here. I'm scheduled, I think, for an hour, but if anybody wants to stay on, I'm glad to stay on and talk. Well, talking is something that I do, uh, and I like to do it. Sometimes I think I talk too much. But uh, I do think that I've been involved in a lot of things that happened that are very important to America, and it's changed the nation for the better. And I said um, in a little piece that I did recently, uh, that I'm very mindful that lawyers are really uh, <clears throat> the instruments of social change. And they have done that, uh, been engaged in that uh, activity from time immemorial. Well, lawyers, of course, were the guys who 
founded the country. He drafted the Constitution, and this is Constitution Day. <coughs> and there were lawyers, of course, back then, who drafted the Constitution, which has served us all these years. So it is a very distinct pleasure for me to be here on Constitution Day and to have a few remarks about things that have happened under the Constitution and in the Supreme Court over these many years. I, I looked at the Idaho rules in uh, preparing to come out here. And of course, I was not surprised to see that the Idaho rules state clearly that lawyers play a vital role in the preservation of society. And that's, that's true, as I said just a few minutes ago. But one of the very uh, important things, I think, for you in Idaho, is that you have this very fine institution, Concordia Law School in Boise. And it is also the mission of Concordia to change society for the better. So you have a double benefit here in Boise. I was born during the heart of the Depression in 1933. That's a long time ago. And it was a very bad time for American history. Uh, my father luckily had a job, but I think it was a part-time job. And most people, or many people, did not have a job. There were soup lines and many, many things that people uh, who were most of the people in the country were in a very bad financial And I went to school, I began school in uh, 1939, I guess, just on the beginning of World War II. And grew up pretty much in World War II, so I had been through that period. And, um, and I went on from there. But I was born in Virginia, Ronald, Virginia, in a segregated society. Racial segregation was prevalent. And from my very youngest uh, youth, I was aware of the segregation and I hated it. And I remember when I was perhaps five or six years old that I became aware of the segregation and I couldn't accept the fact that I should have to drink from a separate water fountain. Or, uh, and so what I did, I would look around and if I didn't see anybody looking, I would sneak and sneak out of the white fountain. <laughs> and then the public toilets were white, I mean white and colored. And I would never use a public toilet. And they, of course, you had to sit at the back of the bus. And um, I wouldn't sit at the back. What I did is I would stand, even as a small boy, in the middle of the bus. You could stand in the middle <coughs> and not sit at all. And if there were people on the bus, I would stand. Or if there were no people on the bus, I would still stand. But I refused to sit. And uh, those days, racism was so prevalent that um, the Ku Klux Klan was very, very prevalent. There was a Ku Klux Klan in Roanoke, Virginia, where I grew up. And uh, 
And we moved, <coughs> I think it was in 1941, perhaps, into another neighborhood, which was just on the border of the white neighborhood. Because there was an area where people of color could not live. But the, we lived in the area adjoining that. In fact, our next door neighbor was a white family, very nice people, who lived uh, just next door to us. They were white. And one night, the Ku Klux Klan came uh, in front of our house to oppose the fact that we moved so close to the white section. And they built a fire in front of our house. They were hooded. They threw a rock through the window, which said, um, uh, used the N word and said, you better move. And we were petrified. And my mother heard, heard at us, there were five of us. Uh, I was the oldest of five children. And my mother heard at us into a room separate in the back of the house. They turned, my father and mother turned the lights out, and my father got his pistol and waited in the living room where he could see out and see them out uh, conducting their, their rituals. And uh, he just stood there. And they stayed there for perhaps an hour, I think, maybe longer. And we were certainly petrified. But they didn't do any damage and we survived. And my father, actually, after they left, he went outside and walked around the house with his pistol just to make sure. All right. And then, the very next week, the Klan came back to a neighbor's house that lived on the next block, um, the next street, but in the same area and went through the same ritual. But they attempted to set the, fire, the house on fire, which they didn't do fortunately in our case. And as they approached the house to set it on fire, the neighbor shot one of the clan friends and killed him. And that was a real tragedy in Roanoke at the time because this neighbor was arrested. Actually, the Klan then went and burned the house down at some point. And I was a child, so I don't remember very well. But I did do know the house was burned down, and the neighbor was arrested for murder, and his family was petrified and, and uh, thrown in jail. And the people in Rono, they started to have a lynching party. And they were going to lynch this person, and they oh, picked him into jail, and so forth. And fortunately, the judge uh, let him out <coughs> on bail, and they had to move, to move from town. And the house had burned down, and they lost everything. But we were fortunate it didn't happen to us. But that was the environment that prevailed in this country. And there were lynchings everywhere in the South throughout that time. Uh, and uh, it was a very unfortunate and tragic period for America during that time. It was the beginning, towards the beginning of World War II. But of course, that same climate had prevailed for many years before. And it was still well, I grew up and my father died the next year, I believe, or several years thereafter. And that we were left uh, without a father. And uh, my mother was uh, a young woman with five children. But we had to struggle along. And I started working then. And I've been working ever since. I feel that. But um, we, we survived. And my mother was very strong, 
and we were, and we got along very well. And then uh, I finished high school in Toronto, in the segregated society, and uh, went to college, decided to go to college. I had worked and saved some money, which wasn't much, but uh, fortunately I was able to get to Morgan State College, which was a segregated school, obviously, because people of color could not attend any schools where white people attended. And um, Morgan was very good for me. I, I was going north, I thought, to get rid of segregation, but when I got to Baltimore, I saw that they still had segregation in Baltimore, Maryland, segregated schools, segregated restaurants, and the like. And I, of course, was a radical from the beginning. I didn't sit in the back of the bus, and I refused to drink out of the separate water fountains. And I decided uh, when I got to Baltimore that I would want to do something uh, more to uh, support social change towards um, eliminating the racial climate in America. So even as a college student, I was uh, engaged in that. And at that time, just about that time, there was a man by the name of James Farmer, who was a social activist. And he founded the Council on Racial Equality. It was a national organization, and they had a chapter in Baltimore. And I joined the Baltimore chapter along with a, a good number of other Morgan students. And we decided, uh, with the help of white students from, I think, Goucher College, which is in Baltimore and some other colleges, uh, that we would try to end segregation at the lunch counters and the movie theaters. And the white kids, along with us, uh, we began uh, to engage in sit-ins to open up the lunch counters. And many of you read, may have read that uh, lunch counter uh, sit-ins started in Greensboro, I think in the 60s, but we were doing it in the 50s. And I think we were the first ones to do that. And we would uh, go to these lunch counters, Woolworths, and uh, they have Woolworths then, and Presky's, and some of the other five and dime stores they were then. And there would be a, perhaps 10 white, young college students, with 10 of us, and we would gather together somewhere and go to a particular lunch counter, a Presby or Woolworth. And we would go early um, before this, uh, probably we'd go about 11.30, because it was for lunch, and that was a goal. And so we would fill up all the seats in the counter. Uh, there might be someone sitting there at the time, but by lunchtime, or by this time, 12.15, there would not be a single seat in that lunch counter that would be available for customers because there would be 10 black students and 10 white students sitting, filling up the entire counter. And the way we sat it would be one white student here, and one black student here, and one white student here, and one black student here, and so on. And, of course, the server would come to the white students and say, what would you like? And the white student would say, well, I'm with Dunnaville, serve him first. And they said, we can't serve him. They would say, just bring me a glass of water. And they would sit there, during the, and we would sit there together during the entire lunch period. And during that period, that store, that restaurant, would get no business whatsoever. 
And we did that a few days continuously. And pretty soon, their lunch business was totally, their restaurant business was totally closed out of business. So all of those managers came over after we sat there and said, serve them all. And that was the end of that particular door of discrimination for that time. But there were other stores that had no up. So we had to do go through that same procedure throughout downtown Baltimore. But by the end, certainly before I graduated from college, all of those restaurants were open and segregation had ended voluntarily. We also were picketing the, the movies and uh, they were segregated and with the white students. And we weren't as successful for the movies at that time. But my sisters followed me uh, at Morgan. And even though, I guess we've been picketing those movies for three or four years, and they hadn't opened up. We would go out there every weekend and picket with signs and so forth. And so my sisters, my two sisters who attended behind me, they picketed. And by the time my sister was finished, the movies were open. But it took a long time to open up the movies. But all of this was before the Civil Rights Act in Baltimore. Because segregation was not legal, legally required in Baltimore or Maryland. It was customary and it was required. But the law didn't demand it. Whereas in Virginia and South, it was demanded. And if uh, there were white people sitting with black people at that time, they might have been arrested. And I don't know. But I, we didn't, I wasn't interested in solving the problems of Virginia. I was interested in getting away from segregation and solving the problem to the extent I could overall. So I, I continued with that activity. And then I, I was fortunate to go to attend the argument of Brown against Board of Education. Beginning in the 1940s, <coughs> Howard University Law School uh, brought in a man by the name of Charles Hamilton Houston. Actually, it was in the 1930s. And Charles Hamilton Houston was a black Harvard lawyer, brilliant. And he came in and became the dean of Howard. There's an interesting story as to how he became dean. Justice Brandeis of the United States Supreme Court somehow knew the new president who came in at Howard in the early 1930s. And at that time, there was no law school that black students could attend uh, in the whole state of Virginia or in many parts of the nation, including uh, some place in the West and um, other parts of the country. But there was Howard Law School and a few other law schools that students of color could attend, mostly on a quota basis, including Harvard, Columbia, etc., on a quota basis. So Justice Brandeis told uh, President Johnson, well, you got a law school here, but it really isn't very good. And you need to have a full time, it was only a night time, uh, a part time law school at night. You need a full time law school. And you bring in some people and make a really good law school. And you'll be able to 
have some complaints. This was Justice Brandeis of the Supreme Court talking to the president. President Johnson did that, and he brought in Charles Hamilton Houston. And Charles Hamilton Houston was a radical, really. And he was determined to change America. And he did. He began in the late 1930s bringing cases building the foundation to bring down segregation. And among the students of his very first class were two lawyers, two students who became lawyers, Thurgood Marshall and Oliver Hill, who became my friend towards the end of his life. And Oliver Hill went to law school specifically to try to change uh, segregation. And I think it's appropriate for me to talk about this now because this is Constitution Day. And we're, um, this was a change in America cases, they changed the law, and it made a difference. And we've been building on it since. But anyway, there was uh, Oliver Hill and Thurgood Marshall who became lifelong friends. And uh, after uh, they graduated from law school, Thurgood Marshall, of course, and Oliver Hill began to um, participate in these cases. And Ham Charles Hampton Houston really uh, brought these cases beginning with one case that I, I don't know the name of it right now, but it opened up the law school uh, in, I think that was one of the states of West, I believe. But there were a number of cases that were brought, brought and it was a foundation that he was building. <coughs> which eventually led to Brown against the Board of Education. And I was just given that background as to how Brown against the Board of Education evolved. And the Brown was a case of five cases, one in Virginia, which Oliver Hill was a trial attorney, whom I mentioned before, together with Spotswood Robinson, who was Oliver Hill's law partner. They tried the Davis case, which was a Virginia case. And then there was a South Carolina case, which was tried by Thurgood Marshall. And there were several others. There was one in Delaware and the District of Columbia and Kansas. And eventually those cases reached the Supreme Court. And I was fortunate as a college student to, to attend. The way I got to attend was uh, Thurgood Marshall was from Baltimore. And I was going to college in Baltimore. And we knew, uh, I mean, at least the professor knew Thurgood Marshall, my professor. And they got tickets, and so I was able to come and go. And we left uh, Baltimore early, but very early in the morning. It was a December cold morning. And we arrived in Baltimore, and um, there were people lined up at the courts of the, from the steps of the Supreme Court all the way uh, to the sidewalk and then around the block. People lined up hoping to get in. But of course, obviously, there's just a few seats in the Supreme Court. And it was not possible. So luckily, uh, we had tickets and we were able to get in. And I was on the front row, luckily, as well. So when I got there, uh, there was Thurgood Marshall and Spotswood in the table like this. And then on the other side, there was the Attorney General of Virginia and, uh, some, and the attorneys for the parties on the other side, arguing to maintain segregation. And uh, Spotswood and Thurgood were brilliant. Uh, there was among uh, Chief Justices, uh, who are familiar with Chief Justice Warren, 
Frankfurt, I was still on the board of Frankfurt. And, and so but um, it was a great argument. It was a great experience for me and the young, young student. And you know, uh, it influenced me to become a lawyer. When I got to the Supreme Court building, I looked up and the first thing I saw was a, around, all around the building, the words equal justice <coughs> under law. And I knew very well from the time when I was just a boy that there is no equal, was no equal justice, and still is in my opinion, under law. And uh, I decided that I would try to do something to change it, <coughs> to make a difference. And I uh, graduated from college and then went to law school. And when I went to law school, that was another interesting experience. I applied to four law schools. Um, I applied to Columbia, to NYU, to St. John's University, and to the University of Virginia. Well, of course, I knew that the University of Virginia would not accept me because they were not accepting any poor people or any women at that time. But I applied, and of course was rejected. And I, but I was accepted to <coughs> St. John's, NYU, and Columbia. Now, you wouldn't believe this, but Columbia accepted me. But they sent me a letter saying their quota of people of color was filled for that year and that I had to wait until the next year to attend, even though I had accepted. So I wasn't going to wait until the next year. I tore the letter up and threw it in the trash can, and I was so very angry, but uh, then I went on and accepted uh, St. John's because <coughs> it was the best <coughs> financial situation for me, and I was pretty poor, very poor. So uh, during, while I was in law school, I was engaged in a lot of social activities as well. And I, <clears throat> after law school, I, uh, as Dean Salek mentioned, I was uh, hired by the Internal Revenue, the first lawyer of color they hired, and then hired by uh, uh, United States Attorney, uh, first uh, Yes, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, and uh, later 18. And during this entire period, I was engaged in uh, social action to try to make a change. And the lawyers were engaged. Oliver Hill and Thurgood, they were engaged in those activities during that period. And they, there were many, many cases. And ultimately, they uh, were able to not only integrate schools, but to integrate uh, most of the public parts of society. So that was done by them. Um, those lawyers started in Howard, who um, became uh, social activists and they spent their life uh, to change America. And they did. And the time progressed and I was involved with the uh, other social action. I went to the uh, March on Washington. I was in Mississippi uh, during the uh, late 60s. <coughs> with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which was started by President Kennedy in 1963. And uh, President Kennedy sent a lot of lawyers down there. And I, I was in Portland the day before yesterday, and I met a lawyer who was there um, in Mississippi 
with the Lawyers Committee the same year I was there. And it just happened that he came, came there in August of 1967. And I came in November of 67. And it was just so uh, wild that I met someone who was there. And all the years I haven't met anybody uh, who was there serving during the year I was there. Well, uh, we made a change. I did a lot of things. I could go on all day talking about some of the experiences I had. Uh, the one that I was chased out of Marx, that was a really scary one. But I had a lot of other scary ones at that time. And I'll tell you something. When I came back to New York, uh, I think it was in January of 1968, I literally kissed the sidewalk on the, the street. I did when I came back. I was so glad I got back safe. It was really something uh, down there. Everybody in Mississippi at that time drove around with a shotgun on a pickup truck. Wherever you went, you saw shotguns everywhere. And um, black people had to walk, it was customary, on the side, on, uh, on the street. They couldn't walk on the sidewalk. And one case I had while I was there, and everybody had these guns, of course. And there was a young black man who worked for Burger King. And he was coming home from work in a hurry walking on the sidewalk. And lo and behold, the guy picked up the shotgun and shot this young person for just walking on the sidewalk. And of course, there was no prosecution for anything for, that a white person did to a black person. And, uh, but we, I actually prepared and filed a complaint against them, seeking damages. And as a result of that, we were successful because we filed the case in the federal court. And uh, President Johnson had appointed some very good judges down there at that time. And uh, so this was 67. It was three years after the um, Civil Rights Act. But as far as Mississippi and most of the South was concerned, the Civil Rights Act did not exist. They didn't pay any attention to it at all. And what we were doing, we were down there trying to enforce, enforce the Civil Rights Act. So anyway, that's what I did uh, during that time. And then I went to work for uh, AT&T, and I was working for AT&T, and uh, did other things relating to uh, social justice, trying to uh, make things better. And I was engaged in a lot of other activities. During uh, uh, Martin Luther King, as you remember, was killed in 1968. And a few days after Martin Luther King, a few of my colleagues at AT&T, we decided that we would start an organization to promote integration in corporate America. Because of then, uh, you had the Civil Rights Act, and most of the major corporations had started to hiring one or two people like myself. But they only had maybe a handful, and most of them that were in the low paying jobs, and our goal was to try to improve that, and we did. And so we had the uh, Associate, Associate for Integration and Management. And I remember one of the things we did, uh, we ran an ad in the New York Times. We personally paid the money. I, I may have contributed as much as $500 to run this ad. And it was in the New York Times. And even though it cost, the ad cost $10,000, 
And even though it was uh, $10,000, Dad probably but, but we said <clears throat> that the corporate America needed to open up their management to people of color. And that we were there and some people thought we were satisfied, but we weren't. And we were there to make sure and to try to get those corporations to open up executive positions to people of color and to all minorities. And I remember my boss, oh, they were so upset that we were running this ad. And they came, but they didn't fire me. So I, just, I, I stayed there. But they were very upset about it. But we did that, and that's just an example of some of the social activism that I was engaged in during the uh, late 60s and 70s. Uh, and uh, I continued. And then, uh, fortunately, in 1978, there was a man from Virginia, from Richmond, actually, Actually, who was a lawyer who had become employed by the most prestigious law firm in Virginia. And he uh, was the very conservative, white, young, Republican. He was appointed by President Nixon to the United States Supreme Court. Lewis F. Powell. And Lewis F. Powell, although he was very conservative, uh, he was a true lawyer. And he believed that the is best served as an instrument for social change. And he was willing to do what was right. So a case came before the Supreme Court, I think it was 1978, called Baki against, um, I don't know, San Francisco Unified School District. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, that, came, that case reached the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court was divided equally. It, it, the case dealt with quotas. At that time, I mentioned the Columbia University quota, which I was involved with. But there was a quota in most universities where they would take some employees, some people of color, but they would only take a quota. And there was a part of the Supreme Court who favored the quotas, and part of the Supreme Court that was against it and wanted to overrule it. And Thurgood Marshall then was on the court. And um, Justice Powell had just been appointed. And he studied the whole thing and it made a difference, which has changed America. Justice Powell came up with the theory of affirmative action, which in my opinion is far better than quotas because quotas are limited. And as in my own case, when the quotas fill, that's it. They don't accept any more people from that group. But under affirmative action, there is no limit. You can consider race 
as one of the factors in emissions. And in my opinion, that was a far better system than voting. And it's made a far bigger difference in America than we had on the voting seats. And it was Lewis F. Powell who did that. A conservative Republican from Virginia. And by the way, he was a very close friend of Oliver Hill. And Oliver Hill was a very liberal Democrat from Virginia who was poor and who was dedicated to civil rights. But they became friends for reasons uh, I won't explain because I'm running short of time, but they did become friends. And Oliver Hill supported Lewis Powell for the Supreme Court uh, position. And they've had a big difference in Powell being appointed because there were a lot of people who opposed Lewis Powell because at the time he belonged to an all-white country club and uh, he uh, was a part of Hunter Williams. And actually, one of his law partners had been engaged in the Brown against Board of Education case, one of Lewis Powell's law partners. And even though the Brown against Board of Education case was decided a long time ago, it, the aftermath of Brown lasted for almost two decades. Uh, Virginia had, they closed schools and there was tremendous uh, amount of litigation involved just to keep black people out of school, out of integrated schools and to um, keep uh, integration from occurring. In the country. But Lewis Powell made a difference. And it's because of Lewis Powell that America's changed. Uh, we would not have had maybe uh, even President Obama if it were not been from the back. So I want to say in uh, concluding before I open it up to the questions that in my judgment, it doesn't matter a darn bit whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're conservative or, Republic, or conservative or liberal, if you're a lawyer and you want to do what's right and follow the principles of your rules here in Idaho, and the same rules are in Virginia, um, America will continue to change for the better. Because it's my firm belief that lawyers make a difference. And I'm so proud that we have Concordia here, which is also dedicated to social change. So you're pretty lucky in Idaho. Uh, Concordia, keep up the good work. Anybody with any questions? Uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Mr. Dunham, my name is Brian Carter. I can relate to your father in the experience he had when his family faced a threat and he uh, provided himself a tool to help with that. A pond here in Boise in April of 2012 some persons of a um, Hispanic descent had made some explicit deleted statements about dealing with those white people and I had to provide them insight that I was well equipped myself to handle any threat that they brought about. Uh, they were later talked to and I had learned that they were actually gang members. Uh, so I can with your dad and how he has fear for his children and their safety. My question for you is, sir, in all of your civil rights that you do, would you like to see of the day where 
to organizations which are great organizations such as NAACP and uh, other um, elements where we give uh, awards away to people who because of their um, African descent background that it's merely just everybody's recognized and well and, and finally what is your what is your joy first of all thank you for being living history that you are what is your joy in seeing that we now also have an african-american president well i'm glad to see it but frankly um my real view is um i am not so much interested in having a black president as i am having equality and opportunity for everybody women i'm for that and whatever and it's, it's great it's way beyond time i think to have a black president that has to do but uh, that is not something that i put at the top of what i am interested in i'm interested in social change and we can have that under conservative republican that's fine or a black uh, a black liberal democrat but again i don't want to uh, have you misunderstand that i'm not very proud that we do have a black president and i've been working towards the opportunity when there will be to have it but just the fact that there is a black president to me is not the most significant thing. The significant thing is that we have America where everybody has the opportunity. Everybody. And where uh, we won't have these problems relating to race. And of course, I'm hoping that racism will finally be gone. I was instructed to wait for the mic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I usually don't do what I instructed. Oh, neither do I. As you can see. <laughs> that's right. And that's, that's partially my question. I've spent my career in utility regulation. Okay. I even got to litigate the AT&T divestiture. Right. And you know, utilities, especially at and don't impress me as socially progressive. They are. So I wondered, how was that a fit for you? And do you have suggestions for how we move corporations in socially progressive ways? Because it seems to me that's kind of antithetical to their uh, ultimate goal, which is to get the most money the fastest. Well, their ultimate goal is definitely to get the most money fastest. Passage, there's no doubt. And if it conflicts with social justice, needless to say, social justice loses. But I think uh, there's now a consensus nationally that social justice for corporations is desirable. And they get a lot of credit <coughs> from social justice. And even though it's very limited in many cases what they do, and they do it mostly for publicity, I think. Uh, it, as long as it's done and accomplished, I, I'm happy to see it. But I think there needs to be more pressure, even more. We started, oh God, what is it, 50 years, 40, 50 years ago, um, pushing for that type of thing, activism, and I think we had an influence in getting AT&T to become as a social justice, uh, as an advocate for social justice, and I'm very proud of at and I think it's pretty good nationwide. But there's a lot of work to be done. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Thank you, sir, for your message today. In uh, 1971, I attended New York University College of Law, obtaining a, 
on the LLM degree, one of my professors teaching a civil rights course was a man named Conrad Lynn, who I suspect uh, you might know. Uh, he took his students, including me, to uh, the criminal trial parts in Manhattan, and uh, we sat in on William Kunstler's conduct of a defense of Black Panther murder trials. Uh, that experience and Conrad Lynn's message helped me become a trial lawyer and encouraged me to do so. Uh, I suspect that perhaps somebody in the room today has been likewise affected by your message. Can you tell us, sir, assuming that somebody here will go to work, in what regard do you still see inequality under law? Where should they be directing their efforts? Well, that's an easy one. I see it every day, inequality under law. I think, um, especially uh, in the criminal justice system, and one of the things I'm working on now uh, is restorative justice. I don't know if any of you know about that. You have it in Idaho. There's a judge up in, I think it's northern Idaho, named Mark Ingram. Anybody know him? You take your head, you know him? Okay. And he's working on a program called historic justice. In my view, <clears throat> one of the most serious problems facing America today from both a financial uh, condition as well as uh, just the justice, the inequality of justice, is the criminal justice system. And it costs $30,000 a year to imprison anybody. And it seems that there are a lot of people who still want to keep people in jail who really shouldn't be there. And remember, they should remember, that everybody who goes to jail, unless they're life in prison, they'll be out at some point. So we need to look at the criminal justice system and do something about it, in my opinion. And I think restorative justice will help <laughs> because it is a system whereby uh, I'm working to try to get uh, uh, to become effective as a part of the criminal justice system in Virginia, whereby the Juvenile Domestic Relations Court, instead of on the first offense sending a young person to jail, they're going to restore the justice system, which is sort of an amelioration or mediation type of proceeding. And they'll not have criminal record. And the state won't have to spend money putting them into justice, putting them in jail, and so forth. So I think to answer your question, the criminal justice system needs serious work, in my opinion. And justice is not there. And I can go on that day talking about that. <laughs> Thank you for your remarks, uh, Mr. Dunville. Uh, I stand corrected on that uh, Baki case. It was uh, University of California, the other party. It was California. University of California was the other party on the Baki case right. instead of the San Francisco uh, Unified School District. Um, but. Um, you say that uh, uh, there are those who uh, view law as an agent of social change, uh, and lawyers, of course, are critical to, to, to the law. Um, what do you believe, then, uh, is the importance of having minorities uh, uh, enter uh, law careers, both as lawyers and as judges, and, and what can uh, schools like Concordia do to help um, uh, create a pipeline for uh, those lawyers to also join uh, in being agents of, of cha uh, social change? Well, I'm glad you asked that. <coughs> Thank you. Was that a softball? It <coughs> was, <laughs> because I was Russian and I didn't have time to say that that's something I'm still working on very hard. The judges, getting the judges, uh, getting judges of minorities, including ones of uh, judges of not only color, but I'm black, but Hispanic and Asian. 
Um, I think the judicial system should look like America. That's what I'm interested in. And just day before yesterday, I was involved in um, lobbying with um, Virginia legislatures, legislature for the appointment of an Indian American from India. I'm trying to get him, help him get appointed. There's no, in the whole state of Virginia now, uh, we have a <coughs> fairly large uh, minority population. But when you leave outside of Richmond and Northern Virginia, there are zero judges color or minorities, Asian, and so forth. So I'm really working hard for that, and we do need to do that. And Concordia can help. Uh, I know in um, Idaho, there aren't that many people or minority people, but you can bring some minority people in through your recruiting and put them in the pipeline. And it will take a while to get them through. But if you never get them in the pipeline, you'll never have them. So thank you for the question. And that's a task for being silent. <laughs> Mr. Donovan, I think we have time for one more question. Do we have one? If there aren't any questions, we'll just say thank you so much for your engaging remarks. Would you like to leave us with any last thoughts before I make a few announcements? Well, I would like to just briefly again thank the attorneys for civic education. Uh, that's a good, and I know what you're doing is important. And, uh, the more lawyers you can get in that, the better. <coughs> And I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to talk on Constitution Day about some things that I think are relevant. And I think, although we've come a long way, baby, we've still got a long way to go. Thank you again, Mr. Donovan, for celebrating Constitution Day CLE with us today, and thank you all for being here as well. On behalf of Attorneys for Civic Education, I wanted to make a very brief few announcements about what's going on in the hallway. As you make your way out and back to your offices, please grab a dessert. Attorneys for Civic Education is a public service project of the Idaho State Bar Government and Public Sector Lawyers section. Edith Picillo and I, who's over here, this was our legacy project as part of the graduating class of the Idaho Academy of Leadership for Lawyers. And it's truly Edith's brainchild. I've just been following and doing many of the good things that she has invited us to participate in. So as a result of that project, we have 15 to 20 lawyers who serve on a committee and our major efforts are to increase participation and funding for K through 12 civics education. So there are two tables set up outside for the two programs that we're supporting this year and our efforts to recruit volunteers, particularly lawyers as judges, and to recruit financial contributions to these two programs that have been cut. IOLTA funds used to fund the high school mock trial competition and those have been significantly cut if not completely reduced and Congress funded We the People. Some of you may have participated in We the People when you were in junior high or high school. That is a mock congressional hearing. And so those two programs are the programs that we seek to support financially and with volunteers. In your materials, you have a little bit about attorneys for civic education. We are not a 501c3. We do not accept donations. We would rather those went directly to the organizations that put on the events. <coughs> 
but as Edith uses the term, we are the booster club for K through 12 civic education in the state of Idaho. And so we seek to get bigger than we are right now, and you'll hear from us again. You'll hear from us in a, a fundraising capacity and also in asking you to donate time for these really amazing K through 12 civic education opportunities. There's also a pledge form, and this is pledge of in-kind contribution and of financial contribution. You have the opportunity to sign up to be a judge or a sponsor or a coach for the We the People competition. There's a table set up outside. I would love for you to get to know that program a little bit better. The high school mock trial competition is out there. That's a program of the Idaho Law Foundation. Carrie Scheffler is there. Many of you have probably participated as judges or community members. And one of the most amazing things to tell you is that the national mock trial competition is coming to Boise in May of 2016, which I'm sure Mayor Beter knows very, very well. As 400 high school students and their families will converge in the downtown core, they'll be on the Basque block, they'll be at the law schools, they'll be in the restaurants, I think they have all of the hotels booked. And that means that we need to step up and volunteer and donate our time and donate our money if we've got that or our organizations do. So you'll see National Mock Trial is outside as well, Carrie Scheffler. And in short, you can make a financial pledge, as I said before, we'd be happy to accept those today, but you would need to make your check out to the Idaho Law Foundation to support High School Mock Trial or the Center for Civics Education to support We the People. Edith and I are available. We will accept your pledge forms if you'd like to mark what you'd like to volunteer for. We will also accept checks. Dean Silak, thank you for letting me make this fundraising pitch. And um, is there anything else, Edith? We invite you to come out and see the tables and have some dessert, and thank you again for being with us today. Thank you.